All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Mona Akmal, who is up in Seattle. How are you doing, Mona? I'm doing great. How are you, John? Great. And Mona is the CEO and co-founder of Falcon, a product and engineering veteran who builds resourcement kind and output driven teams. And uh, you have many products, worked with different teams, Microsoft, Amperity, Code.org, Zulily. And uh, you have helped ramped up, uh, ramped up from zero to 11 in, in a, 11 million in ARR and 15 household brands as happy customers. And what we're going to talk about today is revenue intelligence. And let's face it, Mona, we love to throw out all these new, um, if you like, like categories or, or areas to focus on. You know, it was, uh, it was like revenue sales operations. Now it's like revenue intelligence and all of that. And, um, and people can be forgiven, I think, from getting a bit confused about what do all these terms mean and how are they actually different? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I think that um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that we are venture-backed startups, right? And when you're selling yourself to investors, you have to be a category defining product and you have to come up with all kinds of uh, nonsensical marketing terms to make it sound bigger than it is. Uh, however, in this scenario, I do feel that there are very specific tried and tested techniques that help us understand our go to market data, specifically um, uh, marketing, sales, and business development data in order to make our revenue generation more efficient. Uh, could you invent that wheel all on your own and come up with something that works? Of course you could. But the whole point of technology is to synthesize these best practices into products that can then just be bought um, over the counter uh, so that you as a company can focus on the business that you are in and can get the intelligence that you need to deliver revenue efficiently. That's essentially what the revenue intelligence category is all about. Yeah. And so what, what are some of the elements that would go into intelligence that you would say, okay, these are, these are areas that you need to have good data coming out of? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that, you know, if revenue is the output that we expect from a funnel, then revenue intelligence is really about helping us understand what are the inputs that are driving that revenue and what are the blockers that are resulting in potentially lost revenue through that funnel. So uh, if we think about what are the inputs or key drivers of revenue, let's say in a B2B SaaS company, it is are we targeting the right account? So the ideal customer profile. What intelligence do we have about who our ideal customer should be and what accounts we should be targeting and what buyer personas we should be going after? So that's one form of intelligence, who we target. How we target them is another form of revenue intelligence, which is what are the right channels, messages, campaigns, tactics across marketing, sales, and business development that are going to get these uh, prospects engaged and interested to have a conversation with us? Then we go into uh, deeper into the, the customer journey. Okay, great. They've had a conversation with us, which is like a first date. But what are they really looking for? I, I mean, ultimately, the goal is to get married and live happily ever after. So we want to understand what are the tactics of messaging, conversations, frequency of conversations, number of people we need to be talking to within a company in order for us to get to that point where they want to sign a contract with us and get value out of our product. And the story doesn't end there because now that we have that initial revenue, more and more, you know, companies rely on expansion revenue, not just new logo revenue. So now we have to look at uh, product insights uh, to see if our product is delivering the value that we promised during the sales process. And um, uh, is our product usage high enough? Is it deep enough? Is it meaningful enough such that we can now expand into this account and, um, you know, at best uh, expand the contract value of an account? 
and at least at worst not lose this account resulting in loss of net revenue retention, right? So those are the inputs that make up revenue intelligence in my mind, uh, going from who we target, how we target them, how we onboard them, how we accrue value with them, and ultimately how do we expand our relationship uh, mm. with our customers. Yeah, in order to in order to you know capture that, then obviously you need to have to have all of that well defined and have a mechanism for for catching or for for gathering that data, and a way of ensuring whether that's accurate or or you know to make sure that it's accurate data that you're using. So obviously, one of the first things a company has to do before they even look at like what products they're using, whatever, is actually define all of those areas. And I feel like they're often not as well defined as you would think, even in large companies, even when you're well-known companies, what you just talked about there aren't always as well defined as one would think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would say that, you know, for companies that are just starting out, that don't have any data at all. Revenue intelligence is is not really something you should be focusing mm -hmm. on. You should be working right. with early customers, getting signal that your product actually delivers value and is useful. So that's a very different ballgame. Revenue intelligence really comes into play when you have some customers and you have a CRM in place, right? Because without a CRM, you have no book of business that can be reasoned over. Yeah, uh, you have to have some sellers because uh, without sellers, who is having the conversation? Uh, mm -hmm. You need to have some marketing effort. So you need to have a, a tool like Outreach for sales enablement or sales loft that collects a phenomenal amount of activity data, right? Uh, you need to have a marketing automation tool like Marketo or HubSpot. And that gives you a wealth of marketing channel and marketing activity data. You need to have something like Google Analytics on your on your marketing website so that you can track um, uh, visitors and form fills and so on. And then you need to, you know, because you have a living software product that is live with customers, you need to have product instrumentation data like with using vendors like Amplitude, Mixpanel, Pendo, and so on. Revenue intelligence really comes into play once you have these foundational pieces that are collecting data about various parts of your funnel and is really about joining that data and deriving insights that are going to help you get revenue faster. So it's definitely not something that I would recommend for companies that are earlier in their lives. I would say uh, at that time, you should be focusing on product market fit and focusing on getting your foundational go to market tech stack in place. And then we can have a great conversation about what to do with that tech stack and all the data that it's generating so that it's not useless, that it's actually being used to run the business, not just report on the business with a couple of pretty dashboards that we all like to show in board meetings. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, and obviously, I think today the, the sales stack has become an issue in itself because sometimes I, I liken it to... You ever seen those, uh, you know, where people have added like lots of equipment to something and they're plugging things in here and there's cables going there and they're adding another one and you think the whole thing is going to go up in flames in any, any moment. I feel like that's how a lot of um, a lot of technology stacks have actually evolved, particularly since you know, we've moved to, you know, a SaaS model for for most uh, most technology. Like it's very easy to purchase something. It's very easy to just roll it out. But using it properly, integrating it, and, ma and making it part of of the overall workflow—that's an that's another challenge altogether. Absolutely, it is, and that's why you know I think that it's really important when you are uh, purchasing any piece of software that you really think about what is the integration story of this piece of software with the rest of your stack, because you might get a couple of extra features from a particular piece of software that you're buying, but if it doesn't integrate well with your CRM, if it doesn't integrate well with your sales enablement tool, then you are in trouble. Now, the good news within the sales and marketing tech stack is that for the core categories uh, where people are doing work, category leaders have emerged. When you look at the CRM market, category leaders have emerged. When you look at the sales enablement market, category leaders have emerged. Marketing automation, category leaders have emerged. Data enrichment, category leaders have emerged. The good news is that those category leaders all happen to work really well with each other. Um, the last point I'll make on that is um, 
a lot of times these tools actually do integrate well with each other, but companies don't um, spend a lot of time and effort in doing the right integration. So having a focus on operations in a SaaS company is really, really important because to your point, if you don't have dedicated people that are thinking about operations and how these systems work well together, you end up with that, you know, wires coming out of things and going into something then short circuiting uh, scenario happening over and over again. And that's not good for business. Yes, for sure. So what, what are some of the uh, what are some of the data points for revenue intelligence that you think people uh, overlook or maybe they're not as obvious to to some people? Yeah, so, you know, uh, it, I'll I'll start with some of the things that people do look at that boil my blood because it's a big scam. Um, and I will I will say this in as many forums as I possibly can. Intent data is the equivalent of reading your horoscope in the newspaper every morning. And, uh, you know, its match rates are so low and the, uh, the accuracy rates are even lower that you are actually better doing a coin flip than you are paying a company $60,000 a year getting intent data, right? So, we all have had this obsession pursuing data we don't have, finding out things about our prospective customers that are not known to us. However, we lost track of all the data that we do have about our prospects and our customers. So one of the biggest data sources that I think ends up getting um, left on the, the cutting room floor is product usage data, right? A lot of times mm. go-to-market teams don't even think about product usage data as go-to-market data. Yet, if, if you were, wanted to expand into an account and you didn't even know how that account used your product, how stupid are you going to look making that phone call? Mm. As an example, <laughs> I recently had Amplitude send me an email saying, welcome to Amplitude. We have been using Amplitude for three years at Falcon. Mm -hmm. Why am I getting this email right now? How open am I going to be to have a conversation with an account executive about buying more Amplitude products if they don't even know that I use Amplitude every single day to do my job, right? So mm -hmm. product usage data to me is a, is a huge and massively powerful data source that we have forgotten within revenue functions. Uh, and go hand in hand with that is lifecycle marketing, being able to do that effectively based on how our customers are using our products for what it's worth uh, in the consumer world. And I've spent half of my life in consumer software. This is a solved problem. Consumer companies understand that their existing customer data is their most powerful asset, but mm -hmm. B2B SaaS companies have not realized that yet. It's only inevitable. It will happen. And then the last thing I'll say is, the second piece of data that I find continuously gets overlooked is history data in our CRMs. Uh, people only look at snapshots instead of looking at historical views. And history is really the most important leading indicator of the future. So if you can't see the trend and all you are looking at is a dot, you don't really know how to interpret that dot. And you know, a lot of CRMs make it really difficult to understand historical trends and historical data. Um, and, and that's why it's um, rarely ever used when companies are thinking about planning and forecasting and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, particularly on your last point there, I just wanted to emphasize that because I totally agree with you. People don't look at historical data. It's one of the reasons why in, uh, with Pipeline and CRM, we actually include a feature called the archive where it has all of your deals, the ones you lost, everything in, in the stage you lost it with all the information, you can reactivate it at any time. But more importantly, it will give you great insights onto why you win, why you lose, where you win, where you lose, all of that kind of stuff. But I totally agree with you is that we is, and, and I agree with you also on the intent data. If I had a dollar for everybody who called me and promised me that they had the new super duper intent data that actually pinpointed it down to the precise person, which of course is absolute nonsense. So I, I agree. I agree with you on that. <laughs> I love that. And you know, uh, this is another interesting thing because as consumers, all of us care about our personal privacy. 
Um, we yeah. don't want people snooping on us and inferring from our search behavior what we are and are not going to buy. It's actually pretty creepy. And it makes me sad that we as consumers have a very different standard for how we want to be treated. But when it comes to selling to other people, we don't give a fuck about their privacy. Like, <laughs> right? <laughs> No, it's a it's it's a very good point. I've often it's often baffled me, and we've all been guilty of this. Is that yeah, we're we're buyers, and we want to be treated in a particular way, but we cross the threshold where they're physically or virtually of our works, and suddenly all of that goes out the window, and we expect our customers to act in a way completely differently than we would want to be treated or whatever as consumers. So yeah, I've never that one has never made made any sense to me at all. Um, but here's the thing is, like you just said, is if you gather the right data, if you really understand and the historical data, it actually elevates you as a salesperson then because you can have intelligent conversations. And that's where we want to get to. Because sometimes I think people think, well, all of this stuff is going to replace the salesperson. You say, no, it's actually going to elevate them because they're going to have to be add greater value and really focus on building the relationships and developing the value um, that the, the product or service mm -hmm. um, so so this is elevating, not replacing. Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you an example of a good sales experience that I recently had, which is uh, my I, I have my Zoom account and my Zoom subscription and I have my uh, Gmail account, my Falcon Gmail account. And recently, a sales executive from Zoom reached out to me and said, hey, Mona, I'm assuming that you have a Gmail account and you use Zoom a lot. Did you know that you could integrate Zoom with Gmail and it would make setting up meetings so much easier for you? If you want, I'd be happy to hop on a five minute call and show you how to do it. That's an educated, informed, intelligent sales executive who is mm -hmm. leading with value, trying to save me time, understands my usage of Zoom. Now, if he wants to, you know, T tell me about something else Zoom is doing that I should be purchasing or piloting. I am very, very open because I feel like his mm -hmm. his interests and my interests are aligned, and I'm not being sold to. Yeah, no, I think that's a I think that's a perfect that's a perfect example, and that really brings home the the message about if you have done your homework or if you have systems who are providing you with the right information, then you can have more elegant outreach than. Uh, than most of the ones we we see. Um, so where do you um, where do you see the future of revenue intelligence? Where are we going with this? Do you think? Yeah. So you know, actually, I'm thinking about go to market intelligence more than revenue intelligence because mm -hmm. unfortunately, the the phrase revenue intelligence has been taken over by a few companies that essentially just do deal forecasting, and I don't consider that to be uh, all encompassing. So. To me, where I see the future going is a lot more tech-assisted sales, where sales reps, BDRs, marketers have to become a lot more educated about product and a lot more educated about how customers uh, use product. You know, product-led growth motions, usage-based pricing motions are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, businesses are buying like consumers. They want to try the product before they fully invest to it and they don't want to sign three-year contracts. Uh, a lot of revenue, like I mentioned, is going to be expansion revenue as opposed to landing mm -hmm. a you know, $400,000 deal. So the days of hunting whales, I think, are over. And that's great because that's how businesses win, right? Uh, customers get what they want, which means that the best products are going to win. That means that our sales force uh, needs to become a lot more tech enabled, a lot more data driven, and a lot more comfortable talking about product at a much deeper level than they've traditionally been used to. Um, and I'm very excited about that future as a, as a former product person, now spending most of my time doing selling, um, to see those two passions of mine come together. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I agree. And I think that's where it gets exciting. And I think the salesperson of the future or the present and the future um, needs to make sure that they are insatiably curious about 
business, about the business of business and about the business of their customer. And and that's where, as, like you said, I mean, when you take away all these other kind of route, route or routine or manual processes and all of that, and you give people the right data, then they can have those type exactly. of conversations. Yeah. That's exactly Isn't this- right. Yeah, this has been fantastic, uh, Mona. All of Mona's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Falcon. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, we started Falcon uh, about three years ago with Greylock as our lead investor. We just raised our Series A. And uh, we are a go-to-market intelligence company that essentially brings together product, usage data, sales data, marketing data, and then turns it into a sales rep's superpower so they can get as much revenue as fast as possible and hopefully uh, spend more time with their family and less time freaking out about how they're going to hit their quota. Um, And uh, very excited to have had this conversation with you, John. Yeah, listen, it's been fantastic, Mona. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, the more quality, better quality, better quality data, better quality sales, better quality of life. There you go. That's right. All right. Well, listen, thanks again, Mona. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.